from prior sales, so I used to work at a Toyota dealership, right? And most of my sales period, even with from my housing, real estate, mm -hmm. to cars, was mostly all women, right? Okay. Mostly all women. Women got the jobs, women got the means, they got the income, whatnot, so forth and so forth. So at Toyota, 85% of my clientele was women. I sold cars too. So I believe that when I came over to sell cars now, mm -hmm. I opened up this dealership that all my clientele would be women too. Furthest thing from the truth. So I opened up and I started getting cars that females would like. Do the then I noticed that it was it was so slow. I would literally be sitting there for nine, ten hours a day. Maybe mm -hmm. two people might pop in that weren't didn't even want a car. And I'm just literally sitting there like something's not right. So you sit down, I believe that that's when God talks to you. That's mm -hmm. when you're able to really sit down and listen clearly to what he's trying to tell you. Mm -hmm. Or at least you're able to take the footsteps to go in the right direction. I started a 35 questionnaire about my target demographic. And I asked random people, people that I knew, 35 questions about cars, about buying, about mm -hmm. everything. And then that, I found out that women aren't my target audience anymore. And the difference was that Toyota, that was with a brand name that they could trust. With this dealership, they didn't know about it, so they didn't trust it. And women don't buy off deals that I was giving, trying to give the best deals. They buy off a name, off name recognition for the most part, for the most part. At any rate, now I come to find out that my target audience is people like me. The guys that want deals, people that want deals. It's just about the deal and the type of car that they want. And without that pain, I would have been still doing the same thing I was doing then. But now I'm going to research the type of inventory that my demographic likes. So I'm interviewing people. And this is another thing. I'm not just sitting back and being inactive when stuff is not going how I want it to go. I mean, I'm going to be proactive. I'm going to go find solutions. Push us up. We're going to do what we got to do. We're going to get this money. We're going to make it pop. We ain't come this far just to be not make it pop. And so that was more or less my thing is like, we're gonna find out who our market, our target audience is and what they want. This is the other thing, the universe, God, the creator, once you solidify yourself to your purpose and commit to your purpose and to your journey, the universe, God is gonna help you find, you know, go all that way. They're not gonna do it if you one foot in and one foot out though. Okay, so you once you commit to that purpose and commit to your journey, I got overhead, I got rent, I got all type of things holding me down, but for some I was able to stay in business that amount of time to find out these things. To know better, to know, you know, a cause of my own, it was something greater than me was able to do that. Once again, it was just me in there months ago. I'm in there by myself doing the whole thing. Now, I got three people working at the dealership with me to no help of my own. But at the same time, they wouldn't be there if I didn't stick in it and stay in it for the long haul. So that was once again me standing out, playing my feet, saying whatever, however it goes down, it's going to go down, but I'm going to be here. And they're going to have to bankrupt me for clothes and the police going to have to pull me out of this dealership for me to leave. Talk a little bit about, since, you, since we're talking about perseverance, about the perseverance you had to use with even getting the dealership in the first place. As you know, I opened up my business, hardly made any money the first few months of opening my business. Prior to that, I was working to get the dealership open for about 18 months prior to that. Um, and there's so much red tape that you have to deal with as far as going through the city, zoning, approvals, background checks. The spot that we had used to be a gas station and we rehabbed it and turned it into the car dealership. We had to do things that we <laughs> were unorthodox or unorthodox to say the least in order to get to this. But one of the things I was telling uh, Jackson about as far as this is that I literally went to the city maybe about 15 times at least to try to get approvals. Denied, 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 go back, change this, denied, 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 go back, change this. It's like four or five different levels. You had to get zoned first. Then you had to get approval with this. Then you, and after zone approval, the city has to come out and do this. Now you have to get inspected for this. And that's just the city of Chicago. We ain't talking about the state of Illinois granting you an actual license. 
So they wanted to go my background check, look at different things in my background. I had to have officers contact me, come to the spot. They want to know where I live at, know what I did when I was 12. All types of stuff. Why y'all was getting vetted to be Congress or something like that. So at any rate, though, it took so much determination and money and dealing with architects and lawyers before we even put a car on the lot. So I'm literally paying. And this is this is why the, the law of perseverance, which is in my book, is so real, is because I had to go through all that, which a lot of people would have quit it. Well, sometimes I even thought, like, maybe it's not even worth it. Let me just do what I've been doing and do what I know. But every chapter of your life with growth is going to require a different aspect or characteristic out of you. And one of the things that God blessed me with is just to not give up, just to stay in there long enough to see the victory. So even get denied all those days, all those times, going back home with no license, spending literally my last amount of money on licensing, not knowing how I'm going to put a $20,000 fence up or how I'm going to get $50,000 worth of inventory on my lot. Not knowing about none of that, but still having enough faith, enough perseverance to put all of these things, all this work and all this money into this dealership before I even know if it's going to work or not. How much uh, spirituality... Or do you incorporate? Faith is pivotal. It's going to make or break your whole operation. Through heartbreak, my faith has become stronger. At times, the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, has shown me that my faith can overpower any aspect. So I'll give you an instance on how my faith... Uh, and, and, and God said, anytime you chase a success, you're going to have omens. And God will send you omens, the kind of reassurance of what you need to be doing. True story. The first house I was rehabbing, I went broke. After I quit my job, I went, went in there. The, the contractors tried to play me. With the job went out. Way, we needed way more materials, way more money than we thought we had. So I was at a point of a three-month project that I thought should have been three months. I'm in like month nine now, month ten. And I'm sitting in the room because I actually went to go live at the house while I was rehabbing it. So I could protect my investment. That's how much committed I was to it. I'm sitting in the room and I'm asked out, dead broke. They enclosed my bank accounts. They closed my bank account, told me, you know, you've been negative too long in your bank account. We're gonna we're gonna close it down. True story. Chase, I still to this day cannot go with Chase. <laughs> <laughs> closed my bank account down, maxed out my credit cards. I'm sitting in the thing like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Because I literally can't. We still need money to finish this project. I don't have money to buy toothpaste and clothes and to eat like that. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I sat in there for days sometime. And it was, it was enriching because it, it, it gave me a, uh, a sense of what I need to do. So long story short, I would call my mom. I remember specifically this day calling my mom and being like, man, mom, you know I'm all about the fight. But I don't know how I'm going to do this. She like, if I had some money, I'd give it to you. I'm like, I know you don't really have a lot, a lot. I know you don't know it. That's not it. I'm like, do you think I should try to go back to work? She was like, yeah, you need to make money. She was like, you was making good money then. Why not? Suck it up. Swallow your pride. Forget that. Go back to work. I'm like, no. Nah, Call my girl. <laughs> she, she, and I told her, we told, talked about the same thing. I said, man, I'm messed up. I don't know how this is going to work. I'm asked out. I don't want to do this no more. I don't want to be here anymore. You know what I'm saying? We need money. I want to just finish this so I can get this check and move on my life. So you need to go back to work there because you know you can start making the money there immediately. The whole time I, my book was out though. And I, and my whole thing was like, do y'all think I should just try to go hard on the book? And maybe start you know really marketing my book? It was like, yeah, but the book sales been slow. Maybe you, don't worry about that right now. Go for what you know. Go up there to that job and ask them if they'll take you back, that you'll work diligently. <laughs> they both told me that. I sat talked to them. I'm like, okay, nope, not going to do it. And I decided the next day that I'm about to go hard with my book. For that next week, I hit schools. I hit barbershops. I hit libraries. I hit everybody. I hit gas stations. I hit clothing stores. I hit everybody who would listen. Uh, to how to be successful with 17 laws did they listen? I talked to everybody who would even listen to me made a couple sales nothing major he got a couple dollars in my pocket so like that week that next week after that I'm literally at my mom's house still kind of down and out 
Cause I'm like, I don't know what I don't do. I still ain't going back to work. And then I get a phone call. I get a phone call from a gentleman who actually is a principal. And he tells me that, hey, I heard about your book. We having a graduation. It was in June. We're having a graduation. And I want you to be the guest.